please. Uh, so, okay. So, good evening, everyone. Good morning, good evening. Uh, which part of the world you are? Uh, Partha, I am sharing my screen. Can you? Uh, can you see now? Yes. Okay. Yes. Ah, okay. So, <laughs> welcome to the CGC Level Connect Series session number nineteen. Uh, today is Sunday, January twenty second, twenty twenty three. Uh, today uh, we had a session with Mr. Krishna Kumar Nadarajan. So, a few guidelines for those of you who may not have uh, joined the program earlier. First thing is, please stay muted during the fireside chat session. For the first half an hour, we are going to have uh, both the uh, monologue or a story from Mr. Krishna Kumar, and, and then we have a fireside chat session. During the session, please stay muted. We don't want any audio disturbance. Also, please turn off your video for now. Uh, we want to conserve bandwidth. Uh, but at towards the middle of the session, I will ask all participants to open the video. We do want to take a screenshot of that, as well as to allow the host, to, host and the speaker to interact with the audience. Uh, the entire session is recorded, and the recording will be available in a few days in our public YouTube channel, CEG Connect. Uh, it's a free YouTube channel, so anybody can go and uh, watch all the prior event recordings. Uh, if you have any questions during the program, either for the host or for the guest speaker, you can use the Slido program. Uh, Slido is a free tool available online, and I will shortly tell you how to use Slido. Uh, there will be periodic uh, live polls in Slido, which I'll be, as a host, be able to push through the channel. And I would request all of you to participate in the poll. It's just a multiple choice Q&A or a short answer type question. And uh, the second half of the program would be a question and answer session. And uh, if you had already posted your question in Slido, uh, I will call your name. When your name is called, please unmute yourself and ask the question yourself to the guest. So today's uh, session, as I said, uh, the guest is Mr. Krishna Kumar Nadarajan, uh, a superstar from our country. Uh, he's a guest speaker, CEG 1979, mechanical engineering, a co-founder of Mindtree, and currently the managing partner of Mela Ventures. I'll be the host, and uh, Partha, my friend, would be my partner in crime today. Uh, so to join Slido, um, what you have to do is go to any browser and any device and type slido.com. And when the initial screen from Slido comes, you just have to type this code 37398373739837. 37398837. We will be periodically flashing this code on the Google chat box for those of you who joined late or those of you who don't didn't note it down. So you will get this code flashed in the Google text box uh, periodically. Uh, please join Slido and please use Slido to ask your questions and to participate in the polls. When you enter into Slido, the screen should look something like this. There'll be two tabs, a Q&A tab and a polls tab. The Q&A tab is where you can post your question anytime during the program. And the polls tab is where you can go to respond to poll questions that I, as a host, will be pushing into the screen. OK, so with that, I'm just going to stop presenting. And. Uh, OK, so thank you, sir. Uh, sir, what I would like you to do now is that uh, welcome to the program. If you can take the first uh, 20 minutes of the program or about to talk about your journey from the time you left CEG to where you are now. And what we are looking for is that the program being meant for students and young alumni and alumni in general, uh, focus on things that you can share your learnings, your experiences, uh, anything that you would like to communicate that you think would be relevant and useful to the audience. Uh, people sometimes ask me what I should share. They said personal, professional, anything that you feel comfortable is good to go. Uh, and to, at around the 20, 25 minute time frame, I'll just give you an indication just to say that uh, there. And, but if you want to continue, that's fine. But we'll just give a little uh, notification at the time. And then from there, we move on to the question and answer session. So, so with that, I will hand it back to you, sir. Again, thank you so much for joining. And, uh, and it's all yours now. Thanks so much, Vish and uh, Partha. It's really a pleasure to talk to CEG alumni globally. Uh, maybe a little bit extend and take the liberty of Vish's question, not to just talk about uh, leaving CEG, but also some of the things which I learned during nearly my final year in CEG. Yeah. In fact, when I go back to 79, I think in a way it was very, uh, I think, unique in the context of uh, my own career and how it shaped me over several years. Uh, uh, instantly, I was the first honor student to become the student president. Uh, wow. 
Wow. Uh, prior to that, I think uh, the general qualification to become the student union president was that you should have at least eight arrears. Without that, I think uh, <laughs> you won't even uh, sort of stand a chance. But I uh, probably was the first honest student to uh, sort of make it a thing. But one of the very early learnings there I had running the students' union now is that I think in any public role, the level of transparency and your ability to be uh, easily accessible to people is so very important, uh, which is also the reason why when I was the student union president, what I decided was that the accounts of the union every month will be published on the canteen notice board so that everybody realizes what are we spending money on because again when i think back in 1979 the students union uh, at gindi had a budget of three lakhs it's a large large sum of money yeah and being accountable for that and being transparent is one thing which i really learned in that last uh, uh, in running the students union and i'll tell you one of the benefits of that was i think we were able to substantively save money and also live behind a legacy. In fact, uh, I don't know how many of you know if by the side of the canteen, there's a small students union office uh, which got built. That got started in 1979, mainly from the savings we made uh, by being more prudent and being in a way responsible for what I would call investor or stakeholders money. And that's the second big lesson which I really learned, saying that when you're in roles which are more public, I think you need to think in terms of stakeholder interests. How are you really working for them rather than being uh, pulled away from the power of the uh, job and the role which you uh, uh, start doing? Now, having said that, I think it was like typically <clears throat> any uh, year in Gindi, I think uh, one rarely uh, sort of was in class beyond maybe one or two days. And to that extent, a lot of action happened. Uh, uh, it was the year when the government announced that uh, this is going to be a separate university. And uh, unfortunately, for people who joined under Madras University, I think the decision was that they'll all get degrees under, at that time, called the Peraringa Anna University of technology. So we had to take some tough calls and the president was coming to inaugurate. Uh, we had a, a strike a couple of days before and uh, just one and a half hours before the function, we signed an agreement to the education minister that all students who joined under the Madras University will still get degrees from Madras University, not because of anything else. See, Gindi is uh, probably a college of engineering gindi is a well-known global institution it's not a college which is just sending its graduates just across india and uh, my own uh, thought on that was many people were applying overseas and for universities to understand what is pout which is pairing and under university of technology would be difficult before building a brand fortunately i think uh, just before uh, the function Thankfully, with the intervention of the then CM, uh, Dr. MGR, I think we managed to sort of sort out this uh, issue, which again gave me one of my biggest learnings saying nothing is impossible as long as the cost is just and your position is a realistic one, which is based on strong logic behind it. Um, so that was sort of one of the learnings. Um, and having said that, since I said it was the last and final year, and one obviously sort of uh, uh, got, got through it, but suddenly towards the end, uh, I just realized that I wasn't adequately prepared for the future. Uh, sometime in February, March, uh, uh, the craze in the campus then was to go for an MBA, and a couple of bright people had gotten to IAMs, uh, they got their interview calls. Um, so suddenly, to be honest, I was feeling a little left out, saying, uh, hey, I have not attempted that fully. Yeah. So what should I really do? So I really put my effort then for the uh, number two management institute, which is XLRI. And then, thankfully, I did well. I got an interview call. And uh, after Gindi, 
I directly went into my business school for my business management in XLRA Jamshedpur. Where again, I think many times one wonders what is the uh, real use of a business degree after management, and people really go into selling soaps and shampoos after doing engineering, which is a very exciting field. Um, but I had always uh, said that, hey, I'll use the business education mm -hmm. as a means to understand how businesses are done. And I'll get into a field which I think also leverages on what I've learned in engineering, which is logic, which is knowing how things work. Um, and with that, I didn't really attempt even going to the consumer product companies like uh, Unilever or Procter & Gamble or uh, Nestle and many of those, which honestly at that time were very attractive uh, paymasters, which were uh, uh, what you could call the banks, city banks and others. Uh, uh, <clears throat> so one of my uh, learning sort of the business school was, I think you need to look at uh, uh, postgraduate programs as a way to see how that really leads you into where you want to be. I was always very clear that uh, I needed to understand the nuances of a business, how it gets done, and would like to be in more a managerial role, which is how I saw MBA as being important. Uh, and the network which you build in MBA is substantively strong and uses you, which really brings to my other learning in terms of through your career, how are you building your own personal networks? Because uh, many times I advise uh, young entrepreneurs or uh, people who are early in their career that many of us don't realize the value of building networks. Because uh, the network is like a savings bank. You have to deposit in it before you withdraw along with interest. Uh, so unless you sort of make the uh, make it a habit to meet new people, understand what they do, and build relationship with them. You never know when you can leverage them. Uh, so the two years which I spent in XLRI really taught me the power of networks, how I could leverage. And even today, that network is very strong. If I need something in some other field, and if there is uh, an alumni of XLRI or somebody who has been a batchmate, I'm able to access them easily. and really use them to help me either solve an issue or try and indicate in terms of who could potentially help me out solving. Yeah. So the power of the network was something which I really learned uh, during my stint uh, in XLRI. Yeah. Having uh, come out of XLRI, like I said, I really wanted to be in a field where I could leverage both my engineering talent uh, and what I learned through MBA. And it was at that time in 1981 when the whole information technology industry in India was really at a very nascent time. Uh, IBM had just moved out of the country. And Mr. Ramakrishnan, who is a part of uh, this meeting, he used to work with a company called ICL, which was the other large global company which was operating in India. IBM decided to move out. That gave access to a couple of Indian companies to start. Uh, and uh, the most well-known among them was HCL Technologies, which even today is uh, very large in the information technology business. Uh, again, Mr. Shivnadar is uh, from Coimbatore and one of the best entrepreneurs from Tamil Nadu. Um, so I decided to join Wipro, which was also at that time just entering into the uh, information technology field. And they were really an outsider, an outlier, because it was a consumer product company which decided that technology is the next big wave, uh, and they wanted to get into it. Uh, there were many people who believed that a consumer product company could not get into technology. But uh, after meeting Mr. Premji, who interviewed me for about four and a half hours, uh, uh, I said <clears throat> clearly, this is the company which I really want to work because the founder is so passionate and a person with so much humility that for recruiting a campus grad, if he's spending four hours, he really is serious about the business. Um, so I joined uh, Vipro very early on uh, in my life. And again, 
though Wipro was not a startup, this business of Wipro was like a startup. The parent business was in Bombay, the factory was in Amalnir, and uh, because Mr. Penji wanted to create a different culture and a different ethos for this organization, he based it in Bangalore. So pretty much uh, in the early days when I joined, I was the first batch of MBA campus recruits. I still remember there were two of us who got recruited. Um, and we got to understand every facet of the business because the company itself was a startup starting from repairing machines to writing software to going in and trying to sell those computers to organizations. Um, I think we got to understand a lot of the facet, which again was a very distinct learning. Yeah, I think early in your career, it's very important not to become too selective in terms of what is it that you'll work on. Because yeah. I find a lot of people passing out of campus saying, Hey, I just want to do this. Uh, I met once uh, a very bright youngster who was passing out of uh, the college who said, hey, I just want to do chip design. And that's the only thing which I want to do. So my point to him was saying, while that's your ambition and vision, to do that well, you need to understand some of the basics of how technology works. So don't. Uh, sort of not do work which will teach you the basics. Um, so the big learning for me in a startup like Wipro was that I think you need to be comfortable doing every job because that teaches you substantively how the business really functions. Uh, and that's going to really help you in the long run uh, because it's not that you can just be very siloed in terms of your learning. Um, and then hope to understand the business in totality all the time. Uh, so my strength in Wipro was obviously very interesting. Uh, as an organization, Wipro was very people-centric. And that's a big learning uh, which I had, uh, saying that in building any business, uh, while you might think of uh, differentiating yourself for the superior technology, superior product, uh, and you might have great uh, uh, go to market marketing efforts. At the end of the day, your winning edge is really ensuring that you have the right people, you develop them, and necessarily sort of prepare them for the future. Uh, so, that focus on people and uh, uh, Wipro used to have a value, then people are our greatest assets. Um, I really started seeing it in the way in which they treated the uh, people, uh, how everybody was allowed to develop as an individual. As a very conscious thought process, they used to rotate people across functions. So even in my first 10 years in Wipro, I moved across different roles. Uh, I started off selling computers in Bangalore and Chennai. Then I started running a region. Uh, then I became the profit center head of the northern region, uh, uh, where I used to do customer service, software, as well as sales. Um, and that really rounded you off. Uh, and beyond that, I think once you reach a certain level, I was brought in as the chief marketing officer of Wipro to build the Wipro brand, which again is a role I really loved a lot. And but my most fascinating experience in Wipro was, uh, I think Mr. Prenji once asked me to run the human resources function. Normally, many of us who are in business roles uh, would say, oh, HR is a support function. Who would go there and uh, do it? It always becomes unimportant for the organization and so on. Now, and I was the first business person to be picked up to do a role like HR. Uh, and I thoroughly enjoyed it because I was able to change the customer sensitivity of that role. We evolved new programs on how we'll make Wipro the most attractive employer for women employees. Uh, and that really helped Wipro software growth substantively. And it brought a very different customer focused uh, uh, in the organization where we really brought in a lot more business focus, even in support functions like HR. Uh, and that I realized is a very important thing because in many organizations, um, we treat support functions as really 
people who just have to be there. We don't make them, we don't give them a seat on the table. We don't make them a part of the business function. So that's a learning which I got on Wipro saying that's very critical to make organizations successful. Now, and with all that background, uh, when the internet boom really started, um, I really thought uh, there's an opportunity to, I also had just started a business for Wipro called the e-commerce or the internet commerce business, um, where I had a lot of uh, deep understanding of how internet is going to impact uh, businesses. Um, and I saw a business opportunity there saying that, I think this is the right time to start a company. Yeah which is in terms of values, transparency and governance as good as Wipro, but will, will address the whole opportunity which the internet throws. Uh, and thankfully by then, I think the whole idea of venture capital has come into India. This I'm talking about almost 23 years back. Um, and because I was in a senior position, I was the chief executive of the electronic commerce and financial solutions division of Wipro. There are a few venture capitalists who sort of uh, came in and said, hey, if you're wanting to start something, we would be willing to support you. And along with uh, uh, several other like-minded people, some of them the pro, some of them outside, uh, I launched Mindtree in August 1999, uh, purely as a company which is focused on building large internet applications for enterprises. Uh, that was really the focus of the company. Yeah. Uh, again, that lesson was that when you're starting, it's important that as entrepreneurs, you need to be very focused on an area where you'll add tremendous value. That's most important. Uh, and that positioning really helped us uh, win new customers. And as a young company, we really grew pretty fast. We reached 100 million in about eight years. And we had promised our investors that if we reach 100 million, we will list the company and allow them to exit the company because obviously they were all financial investors. They were not people who are going to stay on with the company. Yeah. So we listed the company in the National Stock Exchange on March 3rd, 2007. It was one of the bumper listings because we were a very differentiated company. We had delivered results consistently. Yeah. And the issue was oversubscribed almost 150 times. Uh, and uh, then, of course, as a listed company, we set new standards in terms of governance, transparency. How do we treat investors' money as our own money, which means we are showing more responsibility. And all of this helped us become really one of the best companies in the stock market. Uh, in fact, even today, if you go through, I think Business Line about one or two years back carried an article on companies which had created greatest wealth for its uh, shareholders in 15 years. And Mindtree was the number three in that. Uh, uh, Motilal Oswal, which is a very well reputed uh, uh, investment company, brings out this annual wealth creator study. So if you look at the wealth creator study of uh, uh, the last year, that report just got released two weeks back. Again, Mindtree is amongst the best wealth creators in the top 10. Now, so the lesson which I learned in running a public listed company was that I think markets are very rational. You need to be transparent. You need to, when there's bad news, inform them. And as long as you're transparent, open, and ethical, markets will reward you. Unfortunately, I think now some entrepreneurs feel that Valuation is everything, then they adopt uh, shortcuts to do that. I think all of us would be reading the mess which is there in uh, Go Mechanic or uh, uh, Zillow or so many companies uh, for that matter. Um, and that is something which is because entrepreneurs get distracted from their basic purpose of building good companies uh, rather than just trying to uh, get valuations and just become a hero overnight. Um, and to build a good company, I many times used to tell, we used to call our people Mindtree Minds. I used to tell Mindtree Minds. I think building a good company it cannot be done overnight. It is like building a temple. It gets built brick by brick, customer by customer. So there's no shortcut for that. It will take time. Now, so it took us 20 years to, in a way, get 
to that uh, and obviously when you're successful i think you also attract attention uh, and people i think go out of the way to ensure that they get a piece of the pie which is where we had uh, this uh, hostile takeover attempt from lnt and obviously because they had a lot of money uh, they took uh, 61% of the company and that's when i uh, quit the board of uh, mindtree i didn't sell a single share to lnt because i certainly thought uh, the pricing wasn't uh, right for the stakeholders uh, and then i sort of launched uh, my own venture fund called mela ventures where i in this innings which is my third innings uh, i really have made entrepreneurs the center of the universe uh, where i'm helping build successful entrepreneurs for global businesses that's really what i do and a big lesson out of the lnt saga is that people say you never seem bothered about it uh, i'll tell you nothing for you, it is important for you to maintain your confidence and optimism nobody can take that away from you that's the lesson i learned uh, and just because somebody has taken over your company doesn't mean you just have to sulk and stay i think you can always start a new innings you can demonstrate success in that also and that's the innings which i am in and thoroughly enjoying that uh, so i know wish said uh, probably take uh, 20 25 minutes so i think i have walked through uh, my whatever 40 years in no, no, it's okay no, no, i think it's very good uh, it has a lot of lot of a uh, lot of very interesting and very useful learning so thank you so much for taking the time to do that i'm sure that people will be ready to ask a lot of questions one question that came to me immediately is that uh, transforming from a entrepreneur a ceo of a public listed company to a venture capitalist do you see you operating thinking or executing things differently no that's a very important question see because what happens is the moment you run a listed company you are very tunneled in terms of looking at the next 90 days because ultimately your stakeholders want that. So what are you going to deliver in the next quarter? You're constantly watching only your markets. And I used to be in the IT services market. I was only constantly watching what is competition doing in that, what is happening in that. Compared to that, in the venture field, I'm now very broad based. I'm looking at any idea which can change an enterprise in terms of efficiency or growth. So I'm no more tunneled in terms of ambition. I have to do a lot more reading. Yeah. To be honest, as a CEO, people used to <laughs> do the reading for me, summarize it and give me extracts. Today, I don't have that sort of uh, what I would call an army to do things for me. So I have to do it. And the last is, I think uh, this is a role which uh, you have to do a lot of things yourself. I, every week, I meet four or five entrepreneurs. Uh, making assessments of people, making assessments of their technology. Yes, I have a small group. We are a, a group of five, six people in Mela Ventures. Um, but then a lot of things you have to do yourself. Uh, yeah, Interesting, because last uh, month, my guest was Soma Seger, uh, okay. who was the Microsoft. Uh, yes, Soma is uh, on the advisory board of my fund. Oh, wow, interesting. So he was talking about that, saying that the one big uh, learning when he went from a corporate vp of microsoft to running his own vc is that you have to do everything yourself you don't Correct. have you don't have people doing it for you and that's a very big change uh, and and that's probably true when people are going from corporate to startup you know when you go to a startup you begin your own startup then you have to do everything on your own and that's a change that people may not uh, be prepared for so my, my next question to you is that uh, obviously we are hearing a lot of news most of them not so good news in the US about big tech layoffs and uncertainty, funding winter. I mean, all kinds of negative words are being thrown around. Just to get a sense of your perspective on you know, what this is, what this means. Is it something, a uh, temporary phenomenon? Do you think it's going to be going on for a while? Uh, and if you were to be the CEO of one of those big tech companies, would you have done things differently? Uh, I think what you indicated is real but we'll have to look at it in a perspective uh, i think if you roll back uh, uh, just before covid mm. and when covid started it became clear to most people that 
technology is really going to drive a lot of things. Uh, mm. Let me tell you, before COVID, we wouldn't have even attempted a meeting like this. Uh, I think COVID, in a way, gave wings to even meetings like this, which is really getting driven by technology. It could be a Google Meet, it could be a Zoom, it could be a Microsoft Teams. Uh, mm. Gave it to that. And it's not just in this area of collaboration, but across, I think, technology stuff to think. So overall, enterprises are going through what I would call a sense of caution. Mm -hmm. All of them are also over-invested during the pandemic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So it is real that the next 12, 18 months, particularly in the tech field, there's going to be a sense of caution. Demand is going to be, sub, sub, I would say, subdued, which is really the reaction which is seeing the large tech players take, saying that, hey, we realize that economy is going to be soft, demand is going to be subdued, so we are going to reduce that cost. So what would you see as the impact of that on the companies in India, people who do business with the Western companies? See, already, if you really say the large segment of the Indian business doing uh, business to the US uh, is the IT services. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, probably this year, they'll probably do 200 billion of uh, thing. Mm -hmm. Typically, the IT services industry would have grown, I would think, maybe in the 12, 15% range, which means mm -hmm. They add close to about $25 billion of business every year. Right? Mm -hmm. And that's a large quantum of business. Uh, I would certainly think for the next 12 months, that will be subdued. The growth rate will probably, I would think, halve or be at best in the high single digit number, right? mm -hmm. which means they'll grow, but they'll grow only by 10, 12 billion, which in a way is starting to reflect. If you look at for the first time, in the December quarter, the top five IT companies cumulatively did not add too many uh, jobs. Uh, again, being uh, a CG and I'm sure a lot of our employers are all the IT services companies, constantly all of them have been postponing fresh yeah. graduates in terms of joinings and so on, all of which is a reflection of potential slowness in the market which they're seeing. So there will be some impact, but the good part, uh, which I think for the Indian uh, technology industry is that in the transition which is happening in technology mm. from traditional, see, we had several waves of technology starting mm. from the mainframes to the PCs uh, to client server computing to internet. So today it's more driven by artificial intelligence, machine learning. Uh, in all the first three, four waves, Capacity was really in the developed countries and India was purely providing bodies. Mm. But after 25 years with large global captive centers being set up in India, mm. today in the a, new, what you call deep tech areas, capacity available in India is substantively higher. So whatever little work, though the pace of work might slow down, it will still get done at India, which means there will be growth but the growth will be smaller. So the number of jobs created will also be smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Talking about AI, specifically in ML, you mentioned that just now, uh, the latest rage in town is the large language models, chat GPT being the yes. buzzword of the day. And everybody is writing about the great things. I read a report today that um, one of the Wharton professors of marketing gave a test on operations management, apparently a very important course for what an MBA mm. to chat GPT and it scored a B plus. Mm. Mm. And, and simultaneously also saw another report today that the US MLE, the US medical licensing exam, which is given to doctors to get the license, apparently chat GPT did better than most doctors. Mm. So given mm. that, what is your uh, what is your view in AI in general and specifically just large language models seemingly seemingly doing better than humans potentially do overtake humans in doing better tasks see i think in the last few years ai has been talked about but honestly ai has been around for 30 40 years uh, it's only now it's coming into more mainstream yeah Partly because I think there's a lot more work which has been done. And then you have computing devices which can do the, what I would call, large scale data modeling and processing. The firepower which is needed is available 
today through GPUs and so on. Now, mm. so is generative AI or artificial intelligence in any form going to become more mainstream? The answer is yes. Sir. But the fact is, I still think AI cannot replace the intuition of a human being, the judgment required for a human being. Mm. But it may make the job of a person easier mm. Mm. by doing it. And today, with the computing power available, with the software available, after all, GPT-3 is now almost like an open source available to everyone. So anybody who can build an app using that, all he needs to do is train his model so that it can come to the level of efficiency like what a chat GP is. Um, mm. So it is going to get mainstream. Mm. But I don't believe that it will replace human beings. I think the intuition and judgment of human being can never get replaced. There'll be a new set of jobs which will potentially come, man, mm. which could be in a way driven by some of these models. Right, exactly. Thank you. So let's go to the line for questions. There are a few audience questions queued already. Uh, so I'm going to start off with uh, the first question. Uh, what is your view about the startup ecosystem, both globally and in India? I'm not sure who asked the question. Who asked the question? Can you please unmute and ask the question and tell us the context, please? Okay, I guess they are not asking. So let me let, let me try to understand what they might have asked. <laughs> uh, I think I think people want to know what is your view of the startup in India, and, and I think specifically in terms of uh, uh, I would say that if I were to add anything to that question, there were them is that do you see the startup system growing as fast as before uh, or turning to some other direction? Uh, would funding be a constraint? Uh, would uh, resources be a constraint of that kind? See. Uh... I think if I were to just initially focus on the Indian startup ecosystem, mm. there's been tremendous progress in the last five years. Uh, compared to earlier times, today you find people who have been in operating roles, mm. who work closely with customers and who know what the problem statements are, leaving their jobs to initiate a startup. Uh, mm. So the quality of entrepreneurship is significantly improving. Uh, the second key thing is in the startup world, at least in India, there was this uh, wrong perception that if you need to have a successful startup, you need to be from an IIT and an IIM. Uh, today, that myth is just getting broken. Uh, you find people from anywhere who have a smart idea or able to execute well are running very successful startups. Mm. Mm. So I feel highly optimistic on the Indian startup ecosystem. Already it's the number three across the globe. Uh, I'm sure it will sort of catch up maybe marginally or uh, it is behind uh, probably the US ecosystem and the Chinese ecosystem, but certainly it will catch up. It's already well ahead of startup ecosystems in UK, in the European countries. Uh, the other good uh, thing as far as the Indian startup ecosystem is concerned, 10 years back, we were really dependent on only foreign money, mm. which means foreign VCs setting up operations in India. In the last two, three years, there's a lot of domestic capital, which is flowing into the Indian venture capital ecosystem. Mm. So there is domestic capital available, and this number is only going to increase. Mm. And today, there is a just like NASCOM, there is an Indian Venture Capital Association. So there is a lot of concentrated efforts. Government is bringing in more and more changes because they realize that bringing in private capital into the Indian startup ecosystem is good for India-based innovation, and it is to be encouraged. Yeah. Yeah. So I think all these elements, uh, more seasoned executives coming into the startup, uh, more domestic capital available, a more positive government sort of thing. And overall today, I think entrepreneurship has a certain attraction for people. Uh, 25, 30 years back or 40 years back when I started my career, if I told somebody I'm going to do a startup, 
I think people would have uh, imagined that I didn't get a job from campus, so that's how I'm stopping. <laughs> uh, but today, that is changing. Yeah, yeah I, agree. So I think all these four factors, I feel, clearly will make the Indian startup ecosystem very, very powerful and attractive. Yeah, super. So on this context, I want to make a few mention about entrepreneurship ecosystem in CEG. I mm -hmm. think a lot of people in the audience may not be aware. Uh, we do actually have an incubator in the campus. Uh, mm -hmm. The incubator we have on campus is the Atal Incubation Center, which is uh, supported by the central government, Niti Ayog. The Atal mission is uh, is creating on, uh, incubators in various uh, academic institutions and corporates. So we do have one in CEG called Atal, Atal Incubation Anna University Center, AUAIC. Uh, it's a new organization, less than three years old. They have about 30 to 35 incubators now. Uh, the people who run the incubator, uh, it's a Section 8 company, non-profit company. Of course, the university has a significant amount of uh, stake in that. They're always looking for mentors, uh, investors, uh, anyone who can help with the ecosystem. So I just want to make a request on behalf of them in this call that you know, if any of you, sir, including yourself, you want to help with the ecosystem there, then they will gladly take your help in uh, in whichever way possible. Yeah. Network, networking, mentoring, funding, etc. all that. No, I was there a couple of times and okay. even prior to the Atal Innovation Center, yeah. we've done a couple of workshops in CEG. Yeah, uh, in terms of what the entrepreneurs need to be doing. I, I remember you you came to the alumni association when we yes. initiated the alumni. You, you're the, I think you were the chief guest at the time when you inaugurated yes, the yes. alumni incubation center. That incubation center is still alive. Okay. Uh, that is run by the alumni association, but uh, it's not as um, active as you would like it to be now. Okay. Uh, the Atal Incubation Center has now basically become the focal point for all entrepreneurship related uh, activities in the campus. Uh, so request all of you, including us, also, to see what whatever help we can do to bring it up. Because we have a lot of students who are now showing interest in entrepreneurship. To your point that 30 years ago, if you had said, I want to be an entrepreneur or a startup, the people think you didn't have a job. Now students are very willing and wanting to do startups. Uh, and, and, and many of them are also housed in our incubator right now. Rapti, I don't know if you heard the electric vehicle company, Rapti is one of our incubating companies. Yes, actually. yes, I met yeah. them. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, let's go to the line for the question, sir. Vijaya um, Devi has raised her hand. So yes, yes. Uh, Vijaya, you want to ask your question, Ms. Vijaya? Yes, yes. Uh, thanks, Vish, and thanks, Krishna Kumar, for this beautiful speech. It's always, you know, uh, very exciting and nice to hear the mind tree story, you know, its history. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, I had the privilege and pleasure of uh, you know, working with Mindtree not as an employee, uh, but I'm a partner at Cohen Meta Consulting and we are a leadership development company. And mm. we worked with Mindtree in 2018 and 19. Wow. And uh, we had the pleasure of, uh, you know, training around 700 middle level managers. And, you know, even today, as we work with other companies, we always refer back to Mindtree and our experience. In a way, Mindtree had a you know vision to build future leaders, which we actually see in very few of our clients today. Mm. So that was really a pleasure to work with. And you know, as uh, you know, Vish also and you have talked about you know the disruptions currently mm. because of AI mm. and machine learning tools. I think our industry, the learning and development industry, is also getting disrupted a lot. And, uh, you know, I mean, if you have any take on, you know, how leaders, uh, you know, would like to manage people in the coming years, um, you know, any few thoughts around that in the in the context of the, you know, the disruption, the, the nature of the jobs which are changing, uh, you know, currently. And, of course, the Generation Z, which is more and more coming into the workforce. Uh, do you have any insights into that? Would you like to share? Sure. Uh, see, I keep thinking about it. Like you rightly said, uh, the Generation Z is a very, uh, what I would call a tech-savvy generation. Now, uh, obviously, we didn't have access to internet, but they are very well informed. They are far more comfortable with devices. Um, so one of my biggest learnings is the traditional models of training, developing people, which is really driven by a classroom type of thing, is no more relevant for them. Now, 
Mm. Having said that, I think today you need people, while they need to be experts in something, I think uh, the enormous level of digitization happening almost mandates that people need to be skillful in a number of areas. They need to be almost multi uh, faceted people. Now, so one of the training approaches which I think will really help, particularly in mid level leadership development and so on, are more what I call gamified, simulated sort of learnings. Uh, and today's technology enables that to happen. Now, I think there are platforms like the Singapore company called Nolscape, uh, which has a very large center in Bangalore, uh, which does a phenomenal job of simulated gamified learnings, uh, particularly which is relevant to the middle management. So that I think is a trend which will really catch on where it is learner led. They learn at their own pace. It is technology led because they are comfortable with technology and the real ability to learn happens through them getting engaged in that learning, which is where gamification and simulation really plays a key role. Yeah. Super. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you, Vijaya. Uh, the next question on the line, sir, is uh, someone asking about what do you look for from a startup asking for funds? Uh, who asked the question? Can you please unmute and ask the question in the context, please? <laughs> uh, so now uh, I asked by Ramakrishnan. The, many people know whoever I say with uh, four or five years experience, they say I'm into a startup like that. And one basic thing is they look for is funds like maybe a couple of crores, something like that. Okay, so, so what do you look for in them? Mainly, may that do look at the technology or the approach paper or the person whom he has asked. I just wanted your ideas on that. Yeah, again, uh, just to clarify a uh, while uh, prior to Mela Ventures. I used to do angel investing, which means somebody has an idea. I just sort of work along with them and give them some money and uh, uh, enable them to grow the idea as well as the business. In right. Mela Ventures, we are really investing in what we call early stage companies. Uh, what do you mean by that is there is uh, certainly a reasonable product market fit which is established. Uh, and okay. how do we uh, judge that? Uh, we really judge that by saying, do they have at least, we only invest in companies which are B2B, which means businesses which are selling to other businesses. So, okay. okay. The second thing is they should have at least three to five customers. They should have revenue of at least two to four crores. So, only at okay. that stage we invest. Okay. Okay. And okay. then we look for the uh, problem which they are solving. How's the technology? How's the business team? How they've been performing, those are the three, four criteria. Okay. So at least some two, three years, they should have a very clear vision. Yes, yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, sir. On the topic of angel investment, I think one of our alumni, Shankar, has uh, a question slash comment. Shankar, do you want to ask the question, please? Hi, sure. Uh, hi, hi, Krishna Kumar. Nice to meet you and uh, wish thanks for putting this uh, effort together. I'm audible and clear. Yes, yes, yes. you are. Yes. You are audible. Yeah. It's a privilege to listen to you directly, Krishna Kumar. And uh, my question is, there's an effort to kind of create a angel network for uh, CG alumnus. Uh, there's one already in the US. Uh, there's one <clears throat> that is being led by Wish uh, for creating one in India. So wanted to seek your thoughts on that. And uh, I think if, if Mela Ventures could kind of anchor some of these efforts, that would be great because uh, structure, uh, structurally, I think we're trying to create a uh, LLP and things like that, and uh, would be great if if uh, there's some form. I I, I think uh, Mela Ventures is a cat to fund. Uh, yes, a cat uh, to air. Uh, but yeah, I think if there's some way to kind of structure this uh, for a lot of other alumnus to participate, and it it would uh, kind of create that trust and uh, initial uh, anchoring for a lot of other alumnus, uh, prominent alumnus to participate in the ecosystem. That that, that was my question. I, more a suggestion. Uh, seek your thoughts and uh, yeah, yeah. I wish you so can also add again because you're. you're uh, see, Mela Ventures, yeah. like you rightly said, is a cat to AF. And then clearly, we have, uh, Sebi has approved a certain plan of ours uh, for which we have also taken money from external investors. Uh, so we can't deviate uh, from that. 
which is necessarily we don't do angel investing. The reason is because I've been doing angel investing. Angel investing leads a lot of personal time. And honestly, if you uh, look at in terms of engagement time, entrepreneur needs the time in the early stage of developing his idea. So clearly at Mela Ventures, we said that doesn't help us build bigger companies. So we are very clear that wherever somebody has gone through that process, we will help them scale because what we did at Mindtree was to grow a company from whatever zero dollars to a billion dollars plus. So the scaling is where we really help companies and that's where we focus on. Now, having said that, I must just caution you, see, this angel investment networks, there are several of them, but yeah. uh, I must be honest, doing something informally many times doesn't work. Uh, yeah. uh, so I've seen it in multiple, either, uh, it functions once in a while, but uh, you need to have uh, dedicated resources to enable enough energy into that, which means really somebody is just thinking about it day in and day out. Um, and if you want it to be, see, the idea in terms of even making Mela Ventures a cat to AF is because we want to be accountable. Today, we submit our quarterly reports to SEBI. SEBI publishes what our ranking is with respect to others. So we are a lot more uh, accountable because of the regulatory environment. Uh, uh, if you're informally, several people are going to be engaged in it. You need to think, do you want to become then uh, uh, something which is going to be regulated by an entity? Yeah, fund itself. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, actually, let, let me give some uh, background, sir. Uh, we actually have an uh, angel investment group in the US, an LLC company called Gindi Alumni Angels. It's three years old now, uh, coming mm -hmm. up on four years. We started this in 2019 uh, in the US, and we had about a few of our alumni. Today, we have 50 investors, all CEG alumni in the US and in India. Mm -hmm. We have invested about close to $2 million across uh, about 15 uh, startups, primarily in the US as well as in India. Now, the challenge was, the Gindi Alumni Angels USA is only available to people who have access to US dollar funds. We invest in dollars. We invest in a single check through an investing entity. So Gindi Alumni Angels, actually, it's an LLC company, which is a not-for-profit organization. And then through an investment entity, we do a single check investment into companies. We have done a couple of investments in India as well via Gindi Alumni Angels in US dollars. Mm. Now, what I hear after we started doing this, and I've been in angel investing for more than a decade now, a lot of our alumni when I meet say that we also want to participate, but we don't have access to money in US dollars. So the, hence the motivation to create a Gindi Alumni Angels India, which is something that I have started and created a Section 8 company already. Uh, shortly, very shortly, we're going to start uh, announcing it and soliciting uh, people to join. You're absolutely right. It's going to take a lot of time to run that because it's not something you can do fast time. Um, because we have a terrific amount of demand from our alumni who want to invest in startups, I have taken that upon myself to run this mm -hmm. angel group. Uh, but the idea uh, is to, as soon as possible, switch to uh, AIF at mm -hmm. some point, because we want to have the same things you said, like governance, accountability, etc., all that. But because it is new and because it's also new to a lot of our alumni investors, we want to start off with something that I have experienced very well with Chennai Angels and uh, and uh, Kiratsu, etc., all that. Mm -hmm. But we do what we want is that if you can get help us with networking with people that you might know from CEG who we may not know, who would like to join, help, connect, provide a good deal flow, all of the above, now, that will greatly help us in getting this uh, off the day, off the this thing very quickly, off the ground quickly. Uh, I can send you some material about what we are planning to do, so that at least you can have a look and see. You can give, take your give your opinions on that. No, no, uh, certainly, certainly. In terms of any assistance required in terms of getting it off the ground and uh, doing it, very happy to help on that. Yeah. So the next question this, is, uh, yeah, go ahead. Sure. Sorry, just one more uh, suggestion. Sure. If you don't mind, uh, uh, Krishna Kumar, just one more suggestion that uh, I've seen the uh, the mandate, you know, a uh, little bit of reading. So uh, I myself run a startup uh, called Wellfund.org, and uh, we are into climate financing. Mm -hmm. uh, in early stage, at least in India, uh, I think one customer. I think the mandate I've seen is two fifty thousand dollars, and at least one customer, which means uh, it's proven and someone is paying. I think that's that's uh, that's what you kind of look for. Uh, I just wanted to give a suggestion. Two fifty thousand dollars is uh, my, for India might be a, a big a bigger hurdle. It should be reduced to a, much lesser. That's the only suggestion I had. Uh, but yeah, sorry, Vish. Uh, 
that's okay that's yeah yeah Okay, so the next question, sir, is from Kirti Bharat. Kirti says that uh, you're not able to get his network going, so he wants me to ask the question on his behalf. The question is, how do you get into the VC industry in India? I want to help out startups in India in an advisory role, evaluating tech, investment, IP, hiring, etc. cetera. So most, uh, Kirti, most uh, VC funds uh, have a small investment team and uh, uh, they are either called investment analysts or principals. Uh, so best is to connect with a few of them because they, and it's important to know what is the focus of the fund because based on the startup which are advising and if the fund has uh, a focus on that space, then it's best to connect with the relevant investment analysts in that fund who really makes the preliminary evaluation. Now, like in Mela Ventures case, we decided that we'll only have uh, our one of the fund thesis is while it's b2b all things being equal we'll invest in women entrepreneurs so out of our 10 investments 35 percent of our investment is in women entrepreneurs uh, our whole investment team is only women now mm -hmm. both our uh, investment analysts are women now so it is important to connect with those investment analysts because they do the preliminary work on the market, the opportunity, which is the competitive scenario? Is there somebody who's well-funded who's trying to, in a way, uh, uh, capture the whole market and make others unviable? They'll study a lot of those aspects and then express the interest. So if you want to help uh, your uh, industry companies, then I would certainly suggest, uh, and I think a lot of this is available. Most of them are very much on LinkedIn. So even if you search, on LinkedIn for specific funds, uh, you'd find that there are investment analysts who are, uh, whose names and details are listed there. So it's best to connect with them. Okay. Uh, Keithy also has a follow-up question. Um, what piece of advice would you give to a budding wannabe entrepreneur, especially what they should spend their time on? See, I'll tell you many times, uh, I meet a lot of entrepreneurs and they are very excited and in a way sold on their idea without thinking what is the problem i'm solving for the customer well, so one of the important thing i would certainly urge entrepreneurs is to think customer backwards uh, saying that what is the problem i'm solving for the customer and what is the business outcome which he's getting yeah only if you can clearly answer that question should you really go ahead in fact, one of the exercises I find very interesting doing is many entrepreneurs, I tell them, okay, what is the problem you're solving? In 25 words, describe that problem and think you're talking to a 10th class student. So it should be in simple terms. You should be able to explain what problem you're solving, what outcomes you're driving in less than 25 words. So once you're clear on that, then the rest follow. Okay, thank you. Another question coming in the line. Uh, somebody wants to know about Mela Ventures. What is your, uh, uh, what areas of um, business do you focus on and uh, what kind of uh, ticket sizes you can expect from Mela? Yeah. So again, just to give a context, Mela Ventures is, a, like I said, an early stage fund. Uh, and what we mean by that is uh, we really want uh, the idea to be partly proven, which means they should have at least three, four customers. Uh, and revenues of anywhere from currently we have a two crore to a five crore type of thing. That's on the business parameters. Mm. We only invest in B2B companies. So we don't go after people who are building consumer brands because that's mm. a business which you don't understand. Mm. Uh, the third thing is ideally the product or solution, it should be possible to scale it up globally because a lot of my connects are in international markets. So there is a possibility to help the company grow globally. Mm. So we will look for solutions which can scale globally. Yeah. Mm. Having said that, we build also what we call our own thesis on what are things which will potentially become the future. Yeah. Like one of the things which we are really very excited about is the application of AI on computer vision, using yeah. computer vision and AI. Yeah. So we have invested in two companies in that theme. Uh, 
we are very excited about the whole idea of what you call customer data platforms which leads to very personalized marketing yeah. uh -huh. so that's an area which i've invested in now we are very interested in areas which have a tight integration of hardware and software yeah. mm -hmm. because that is something where the moat which you create can be very substantively strong now yeah. mm -hmm. so there are few themes which we chase and we look for companies which are doing work in the thing but on a broad brush basis we only invest in companies which are b2b which can become global our check sizes typically are anywhere between one and a half to two million, which is anywhere from 10 to 15 crores is what we invest as a first check. Mm. Mostly we are the first institutional investors. Mm. We do have an expectation of ownership. So for the first check, which we write, we would like to own at least 16 to 19% of the company. Yeah. That sounds like a normal uh, VC parameters, you know, nothing, yes, nothing, yes. nothing different from that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, th I think a lot of our uh, student or uh, alumni entrepreneurs or in uh, or in seed stage or maybe you know pre revenue or just you know basic revenue market traction etc all that we get a lot of requests in Guinea alumni angels for people looking for half a million to one million dollars mm. and some of these companies have customers but not a lot of customers uh, they have a lot of growth plans but they have cash starved most of the time uh, so we encounter those kind of uh, requests quite often. Uh, occasionally, we do get people looking for a bigger amount of money. So I'm thinking that if we get someone asking for a uh, for a, che for a check size that's bigger than ours, uh, and also a little bit more advanced, we may not be able to help them. Maybe we can we can pass on them to people like no, yourself. Absolutely, we are happy to sort of look at. Uh, yeah. I think there are many companies in Chennai with whom we are in touch with, particularly the IIT Tech Research Park. Yeah, we are in touch with at least with four or five companies which okay. are evolving. So is, is it is it all your companies involved in, involved with tech or deep tech or is it non tech companies too? Uh not uh, all are tech companies. Tech tech and tech related basically. Tech and tech related. Okay, okay. And in terms of business domains, are you focused in any one business domain, uh, healthcare or retail or education, etc. All of that. See, we are very comfortable with retail consumer products. We are very comfortable with financial services. Okay. We're very comfortable with, uh, I would say, little bit of uh, healthcare, but not substantial. Mm. But largely, most of our investments are in retail consumer products or financial services. I see. Okay. When you say financial services, are talking about fintech type companies, uh, or see, fintech is a very uh, again we make a distinction. Uh. If it's a highly regulated thing, we are little anxious about it because a okay. uh, lot many times regulated businesses. Uh, irrespective of the quality of the entrepreneur, the quality of the solution can get impacted by regulation. So we Absolutely. tend to stay away from uh, potentially regulated sort of entities. But in FinTech, if somebody is, I'm just taking a name, saying that they are building uh, a straight through processing for loan collections mm. and mm. so on. Mm. Those are the type of opportunities which we'll be interested in. I see, I see. And one last question from me. I can't stop a session without asking this question. What do you think about crypto? See, I'm personally not very excited about crypto, not because of anything else. I think there's too much of a hype about uh, the, uh, the crypto. Uh. And the fact is that at the end of the day, I think uh, a lot of the value has got generated through speculation now and in a way by lack of availability so anything which uh, is the where the price parameters are driven by limited supply and by what are called speculation i would never be a uh, thing but on the other hand underlying technology of blockchain mm. i think has a lot of teeth in it mm. there are other use cases for which blockchain will be enormously relevant and successful super thank you sir i think we have uh, exceeded our time it's nine ten, 11 minutes past nine uh, unless some i'll oh, go ahead partha go ahead yeah so uh, i have partha's questionnaires on the chat box ah, advice okay. to young entrepreneurs who wish to start a services company i must be honest i think there's too much of thing in terms of product uh, there is enough money to be made in services uh, <laughs> But it's very important to be extremely focused in services because a customer will come to you only if you are an expert. Uh, 
you can't be a generic services company but if you are extremely good in some area i think it's now the time or i think the next 10 years at least will be good time to even start a services business my only caution will be be extremely focused on an area and be really the expert in that yeah I think. <clears throat> if both these are things where I think uh, there is no easy answer for this, uh, I think there's no easy answer. Except I would like to caution you: this whole thing of thinking, saying I'll do services and then build a product company. I've never seen it work because the mindsets required are very very different. Uh, teams their mindset need to be also very different so i would caution you on that um, because sometimes entrepreneurship is all about making a choice uh, you feel that hey i'll make money in the services business and use that money to build a product business but it never works that way because the mindset required is very very different uh, so you have to take a plunge in one Wish not able to hear you. Uh, just to give you context, Partha is the guy who built this portal cgconnect.com and he's been working with me from day one. Wonderful. He, he does all my technical work. He's a 2021 graduate. He's already okay. an entre entrepreneur and he has his own services company. Wonderful. Uh, and he wants to grow and we are trying to help him grow. And he's an excellent programmer, uh, does things very, very quickly. And almost all my IT platform work he does, actually. Wonderful. Uh, uh, so great to see 2021 graduates doing so well uh, in stuff like that. So, and I, we support him all the time. He's based in Nagar Kovil in Tamil Nadu. Good, Good yeah. Papa. Great yeah. job. Yeah. So, guys, if you have any, any questions from the audience, if you have any questions, please ask now. Uh, we'll finish with one last question if you have any. Otherwise, we will close the session. Anybody? And can I ask all of you to open up your video as well, please? I can take a screenshot if you don't mind. Shankar, Kumaraguru, Arun, Nizam. Kumaraguru, Arun. Yes. Vinod? Okay, it's fine. No problem. We'll take it before he opens that. I think people in the US are not ready to show themselves, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little too early in the morning for them, I think. Uh, again, thank you so much, sir, for your time. It was a great session. A lot of learnings, a lot of insights. I think people do did enjoy the session. At least I got a lot of uh, lot of uh, uh, insights from your session. Uh, again, thank you for your time. We will reach out to you occasionally. Uh, I promise you I won't bother you too much. But certainly, occasionally... certainly, not a problem. You have my email. Feel free to. Yeah, particularly. And, in, and people do want to reach you. Uh, they have the LinkedIn profile of yours. If you'd like yeah. to give any other contact information, they can. The best is to... to reach me on my personal email, uh, which is nkkblr at gmail.com. N as in Nancy, K as in Kilo, K as in Kilo, B as in Boy, L as in Larry, R as in Robert. That's right. At gmail.com. At gmail.com. Yeah. Okay. Super. Excellent. Thank you very much, sir. I think Partha has typed that in the chat box. If you want to take a note of that, please. Uh, and uh, again, uh, 
very kind of you to spend the Sunday evening with us. And uh, we will close the session now. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. All the best, sir. Oh, okay. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah.